breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Kevin Sambita of Palladium Books, and you're listening to The Glitter Boys. Well, once again, Kevin, thank you for joining us now for the fourth, fourth, is this number fourth. four? Fourth, I believe it's fourth. Fourth of this series. Either that or I've forgotten how to count, <laughs> which is entirely possible. Well, I'm glad to be here, guys. This has been fun. Yeah, this, is, this has been a load of fun. We've gotten a lot of good feedback on this. Uh, so before we dive into something, I got to ask you, when we had that very first session and we were talking about the early games, I remember at one point, I'm like, man, sure would be great if Valley of the Pharaohs were to be reprinted. And you're like, "Uh uh-huh, sure would. (laughs) (laughs) And then what do you know, two weeks later? (laughs) Oh, man, that's really cool. How much, like, I'm guessing you were aware of this was happening at that time. Yeah, I wasn't sure when he was going to launch, so I didn't want to say anything. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, the, the current Valley of the Pharaohs Kickstarter is by uh, Matthew Ballant, who was one of my early cohorts at, at Palladium and at the Detroit Gaming Center. And uh, Matt wrote the original Valley of the Pharaohs. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's its 40th year anniversary, and Matt's doing a super expanded. Because, I mean, I think yeah. the original book was 48 pages or 64 pages. And he's talking like 250 pages. Yep. And, so he's got big plans for it. He's pretty excited. It was his baby to begin with. So, uh, yeah, he reached out to me earlier this year or end of last year and asked if he could expand it if I minded. And uh, I said, no, go ahead. So he's totally got my blessings. Yeah. And mm-hmm. It should be pretty epic. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, this is normally the kind of like, you know, side discussion topic that you would expect to have at the end of an episode. But these these little interviews tend to be longer, dear listener. So right now, pause this. You've got a week left. Mm-hmm. Go back this Kickstarter project. There will be a link in the show notes. We're really excited. Join the over <laughs> dozen people on our Discord who have announced that they're backing the uh, Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, cool. The, the shock game was on point when that happened. Everybody's like, what? <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, anyway, speaking of older Palladium products. Yes. Today's focus would be on the Ninja Turtles. Now, I think this is the this is the third time we've had a Palladium person, a Palladium associated or adjacent person on here to talk about the Ninja Turtles. So I'm excited to know what else we can learn. Because <laughs> first it was Sean, and then it was you and Sean. And uh, yes, more Ninja Turtles is always a good thing. Yeah, I like them. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Where did the idea come that there's this weird comic book, I want to do a role-playing game out of it? Everything gives me ideas, guys. <laughs> so <laughs> I had heard about Ninja Turtles. Uh, we used to get a weekly sort of newspaper kind of publication called the Comics Buyer's Guide. Mm-hmm. And it offered news and insight to comic books and things. It, it was like a precursor to like Wizard Magazine and that kind of thing. Mm. So I knew it was coming. I'd heard of it. I thought it sounded cool. Could not find a darn issue number one to save my life. Mm -hmm. Finally, I got issue number two. I read it. I thought it was really cool. I I turned to my wife and I said, man, this would be a great property to license, provided they'd let us create any kind of mutant, teenage mutant, you know, mutant animal character. I really liked the idea of, being able to create any kind of mutant animal. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. It's just, just fun. I mean, come on. Uh, George Lucas has gone on record saying that, uh, you know, the the Wookiee is basically a boy and his dog kind of thing. Uh-huh. I, I buy that. People always love the Wolfen in uh, playing mm-hmm. fantasy. And so I thought this would be a great idea. Hey, I'm not kidding you. Within a few minutes... I get a call out of the blue and some guy I've never heard of before and says, <laughs> I am a big fan of, of Heroes Unlimited and Palladium books in general. 
have you heard of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? And I'm like, why, yes, I have. I just finished reading issue number two. And he's like, I think you'd make a great role-playing game or source book for Heroes Unlimited. And I'm like, me too. <laughs> and we got talking, and he thought it would be this this great thing. And I said, well, you know, I got to track down Eastman and Laird. And he goes, I've already done it. Here's their number. <laughs> Why don't you give him a call? And I, I, I did. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the first person I talked to was was Peter Laird. I don't know who was answering the phones or what back then, but, you know, I, I spoke to Peter and we, we hit it off. Uh, I don't know if it was because we were around the same age or, you know, I had a background in comics or anyways, we just hit it off. And he said, you know, obviously I got to talk to my, my partner, Kevin, but it sounds very interesting. And we had a couple more conversations. I met Kevin Eastman uh, on the phone. And we hit it off too, and they said, "Yeah, let, let's let's go for it." So, I mean, you know, I, I was a startup company about what four or five years old at that point. They were a brand new company, like a year, year and a half old. So they said, "Well, hey, you've got more experience. Why don't you write the contract?" And I'm like, oh, nice. Okay, I guess <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> and uh, you know, I wasn't out to take advantage of anybody or anything. Yeah, you know, I was a fan. They were cool guys. So uh, I, I threw together a contract. They said, yeah, it looks fine to us. And uh, the rest is kind of history. <laughs> yeah. For a moment there, I thought you were about to say, I got to talk to Eastman and Laird. And he'd be like, well, I am Eastman and Laird. I'm like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> no, that would have been super cool. <laughs> yeah, it would have been great. So just a moment ago you had mentioned a magical term for me which is a boy and his dog great great uh, great story great comic and great movie but also mm -hmm. from a great writer named harlan ellison and i've got a note here to ask kevin about harlan ellison and the ninja turtles yeah well that, that's a fun story <laughs> so apparently harlan ellison was a, a big teenage mutant ninja turtle fan Nice. And and he also uh, collected miniatures and had someone who painted minis. So one day at the Palladium office, we get a call. And uh, my wife says, hey, there's a guy on the phone who says he's Harlan Ellison and he wants to talk to you. <sighs> and I'm like, what? Oh, my God. And, and, and I, I, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I pick it <laughs> and it's already like after hours because you know he's California, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I pick up the phone. I go hello, and he goes, "Hi, is this Kevin?" And I'm like, "Yes." He goes, "The publisher of Palladium Books." I'm like, "Yes." He goes, "I'm Harlan Ellison," and I'm like, "The Harlan Ellison?" <laughs> and he's like, "Yes, I'm the the himself." <laughs> and he went on to explain how uh, he had to know what the color scheme was. For Doc Farrell and the various characters, because he had someone who was painting up his minis, and they had to be <laughs> exactly right. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, that's one of those things that a lot of people don't know about Harlan Ellison. <laughs> I, I think he may have single-handedly kept a whole host of early, early pro miniature painters uh, employed. <laughs> wow, I had no idea. Yeah, I, I didn't either. It was it was crazy. And you know, I'm like, well, Harlan, you can paint him whatever you want. He goes, I know that. I want to know what the exact colors are. In your mind, what is the color scheme? So, you know, I just kind of made stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> on the spot i remember seeing the the mail-in ads for the ninja turtles miniatures way 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 back in the day i wonder like how many of those survive to this day the ads or the miniatures no, the minis oh god yeah. who knows yeah yeah i would think not 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 that many i i actually had a few but they were stolen over the years oof but they were cool Dark Horse, Mini yeah, Dark Horse Miniatures, no relationship to the comic book company. Really? None? Yeah. Huh. Nope. Nice wow. guy. He was actually involved in munitions and just kind of started doing miniatures. Yeah. You know, on the side. 
So uh, the Ninja Turtles comics, you had just finished issue two, and that that's pretty awesome. Uh, we, when the Ninja Turtles Kickstarter was going on, we released a series of episodes where we were diving into doing deep reads, going back through the entire product line, and and it was fascinating as a fan of the comics, rereading these books and being like, oh, that's right. There were only like four comics out at this point because you can yeah. you can follow along in the game with the comics that are coming out at the same time. Like the adventures, I think, was only up to like issue three or four. And then you've got all the stuff with the Triceratons. And then you've got the stuff with um, the Utroms. And, and yep. it's all just sort of following along. And it's just it's it's a very nice time capsule of awesomeness. It really is. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, you know, looking at the art again, it's just those guys were so good, Kevin and Pete. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. I mean, Kevin Eastman was 24. Peter Laird was 30 or 32. It was their, their first real black and white venture. I mean, and it's, it's beautiful. Their storytelling is crisp and clean. The action is is fantastic. I mean, it really did kind of capture that Jack Kirby, Frank Miller kind kind of feel, and uh, it's just it's beautiful. I mean, what those guys created is just unbelievably good. Yeah, damn. Well, you mentioned the early issues, so so a funny story for me, and I, and I've told it here and there. But one one day I'm talking. So originally I, I started talking to, to Peter Laird, and then I started talking more to to Kevin Eastman. And one day I'm talking to Kev, we're just having a good conversation about stuff. And, and all of a sudden he says, oh my God, I got to go. It's starting to rain. And I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's raining. So, so what? And he's like, you don't understand. Issue number three is in the, is in the driveway. We got to get it in the garage. Oh and I'm God. Like, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad it was saved because it was a good issue. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember back in the day, well, okay, all of this is back in the day. I keep saying that, but the it was, we've talked about this before too, Rifter number nine, I think it was nine, where that cover of the Ninja Turtles is on it, yep. and there's that really, really long message from you about how the license was ending largely because of the confusion with the cartoon and how one was sort of supplanting the other that that was truly sad because you were, you were totally right. Like everything was moving away from this, this grittier black and white and black and white and red style towards this court of, you know, breakfast cereal style of storytelling I don't really know where I was going to go with that. It was just a sad. It was it was so sad looking at that happening. Well, it, it was for yeah. us too. You know, that was a great Simon Beasley cover. That that was supposed to be the uh, cover to a new release mm -hmm. of the RPG. We were going to do an updated version, and Eric was going to work on it, and I was going to work on it, and uh, Kevin Eastman got us Simon Beasley which was amazing. And we actually had a bunch of art done by Paulo Parente and a few other people. And I just sat back and, you know, they didn't want a fortune. Their agent didn't want a fortune for the license, but it was a, a fair chunk of change. And we just sat back and went, I don't know if we're going to make a significant amount of money beyond, you know, the, the, the licensing fee. And, uh, you know, I thought we could get people back into it, but at the time it had gotten what I call kidified. I yeah. mean, it just, and, and the thing is, you can argue that, well, that, what's changed today? Well, what changed today is you have like three generations of turtle fans. And so you have people who, in, in different iterations of the turtles. So you have turtle comics that are for a more adult audience. You have turtle comics for sort of an in-between audience. You have turtle comics and cartoons and movies for youngsters. This, but back then it had gone from this, this gritty alternative comic book to the equivalent of Mickey Mouse. And our primary audience was kids 12 to, you know, 32. <laughs> and, you know, it just, no, no self-respecting high school kid 
or or college kid wanted to play Mickey Mouse. Yeah. You know, and, and it was as simple as that. I mean, we just saw our sales plummet. I mean, at, at the peak anticipation for that first movie, we had shot up to like 44, 45,000, 4,500 copies a month of just the basic core rule book. And then after that movie hit and the toy line hit and the new cartoon came out and we just saw it just plummet. I mean, we went from, you know, 4,400 copies to like 2,500 copies to, you know, 1,500 copies. I mean, every month it just was this gigantic drop. And uh, when the dust cleared like a year or so later, we were only selling like two, 300 copies a month, which, you know, wasn't awful, but it just wasn't great. And we could see it continuing to slide. You know, the source books had, had you know, practically stopped selling entirely. And uh, it just felt like it was time to, to let it go. I wish I hadn't, you know, in retrospect, I wish we had kept it. But, uh, you know, if we hadn't, you know, let it go. We wouldn't have this cool Kickstarter that means True. so much to everybody. Well, as you were saying, three generations, maybe more of Turtles fans now, this sudden onset of this Kickstarter coming out of nowhere, bringing this game back, reminding people, oh yeah, those comics were awesome. And that yeah. it, it exploded in a way that yeah. if you hadn't given up that license, it probably wouldn't have. Yeah. So I guess hindsight, you know, it's, 2020. it's beautiful to revisit it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That was, that was it. Hindsight. It's 2020, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One thing that I always liked about the, the role-playing game versus the cartoon was that even though that I was a young child at the time and I was a big fan of the cartoon, I liked that the role-playing game was loyal to the contents of the comics, including characters. Like the cartoon had April O'Neil and Baxter Stockman and Casey Jones, but they were very different. Oh, Casey was fairly actually on point, but 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 April, totally different character. Baxter, totally different character. And going back to the com- going back to the comics and the role playing game, and seeing the original characters there and their original focus, and you're like, wow, that's ah, it. Just again, it. it it's one of those things where I guess folks, you had to be there, you know, you, you had to have appreciated them at the time to realize how truly inspirational they were and how the, the cartoon for everything that it was worth and all the good that it did, it, it could have done better. <laughs> well, well, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of weird because you look at it and yeah, I, I mean, could they have done better? Could it have been different? Sure. Could it have been more like like Batman? Sure. But I'll, I'll tell you, you know, because I've thought about that because you know, I, I was obviously a big fan of the the comic book and Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird's work. And you know, it, it definitely, you know, when it went to the mass market, it was aimed at a younger audience. Um, you know, largely because toys was the big the big push. And, you know, their, their target market was, you know, ages four to eight. And, and they did a great job nailing that, you know, and the cartoon reflected that. But here's the thing. We all love Ninja Turtles, whatever version or every version <laughs> that, that you may love. Think about it. It's one of the few intellectual properties that certainly everyone in the Western world knows. I mean, you can say Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to a grandma, (laughs) a a little kid, a teenager, guys your age, everybody. I mean, I, you know, when when I'm trying to to explain what we do to bankers and accountants and attorneys and whatever, it's always confusing. But you say Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they're instantly on board. They instantly know what it is. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. And had Mark Friedman not taken it in that direction, would it be that big? Would it be Spider-Man? Would it be Superman? Because that's what it is. Everybody knows the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And that's pretty amazing because not only do they know it, but they love it. People love those turtles. Mm -hmm. They loved them at the time, too. And it, it 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 was clearly a runaway success so much that 
it immediately spawned parodies. I yeah. remember I had a, a couple of issues of something called uh, uh, Adolescent Radioactive Kung Fu Hamsters. Mm. Yep. <laughs> there were several others at the time, but I just remember like collecting these things. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have that comic as well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I've never spoken to another person who remembers that one. So, Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it wasn't terrible. It was pretty good. But yeah, uh, yeah. it was clearly a ripoff of uh, of the TMNT. Yeah. It, and also, what's fascinating is we talked about this way back on the first time we had you on to talk about Ninja Turtles that netflix show the toys that made us yes well there's a later episode of the netflix of that same series that focuses on the mighty Morphin power rangers which is another one of those four words thing 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 yep. thing which wouldn't have come into existence if it weren't for the turtles and then later the turtles would show up on the mighty Morphin power rangers and you're like it has come full circle, circle. yeah yeah it's crazy but it's cool. And in looking back at it, I don't know how, why it resonated with me the way it did. And, uh, you know, why I, I instantly saw something that was worth licensing. I mean, come on, it's issue number two of a black and white comic book, mm -hmm. but I don't know, just something said, yeah, this will be great. And, uh, you know, we did it. And, uh, you know, I think our success in part was that, we were so loyal to the original material, right right down to getting Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird to do all the original art for it, to do a brand new eight or 10 page comic strip for it. Um, that was all planned. That was all me. That was all me trying to be calculating and, and get create a role playing game that comic book fans would recognize and, and want to buy. That's why the original price for it was 10 bucks, 9.99, 9.95 because I figured, well, you know, that's around the price of a one of these new fangled graphic novels. Uh, you know, uh, cuz graphic novels were new at the time and uh I thought, yeah, you know, we give them enough cool looking Eastman and Laird art and we capture that comic book feel and comic book fans will want it and and it did i mean it got us into mom and pop comic book shops all over the place you know that and in robotech the very next year it was like that one two punch and you know we became a staple in comic book stores for like the next you know 15 years so ninja turtles would be the second license i'm guessing justice machine was the first one correct okay yeah, I, I I always say there's only three reasons to to get a license. Yeah, and and any one of those three reasons is is good enough. And in our case, with both Ninja Turtles and Robotech, it was one we think it's going to make us a lot of money. Two, it's going to open up doors for us. And three, and arguably the most important in my view, you love it. You love the IP because so I think it really helps to be a passion project. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my philosophy and Sean's is, is this way too. And so was Eric Woodjick is, you know, we want to take that comic property and bring it into a new medium. We don't want to make it ours. We don't want to make it something different. We want to take that world and bring it to life in a new medium as, mm -hmm. as loyally as possible. And, and I think we nailed that. And, and that's why it was so hugely popular. I, I mean, to the point where, I, I am shocked. I never realized until we did this Kickstarter and talked to so many people who, who loved the role-playing game and loved the comic books. I, I am floored by how many people discovered the role-playing game first and then the comic books. Huh. Were they Palladium fans initially who just migrated to the next property, or were they people who were just at the store, saw this thing, Ninja Turtles? What? Yeah, I think it was a combination of the two. Hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. You told me a story on one of our phone calls that uh, if if we can't tell this on the air, let me know. But it, I thought it amusing that I wanted to bring it up just in case. How much trouble did you get in for sending those postcards out during the Kickstarter? Oh, the the flyer. Yeah. Um. Uh... 
well, you know, we, we needed to, uh, <laughs> we needed to get everything pre-approved and I was just so excited, uh, to get things out, to get the word out that, um, you know, Wayne Smith and I threw together this really great flyer that was part of, you know, part of it was the official uh, press release and part of it was new insight and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Paramount was not uh, was not happy that, 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 that I, I did that, and you know, I, I I apologized. I mean, everything should get approved first. I mean, it just, but you know, they they Paramount's been really cool to work with, so they were just kind of like, well, "Don't do it again," you know, got to do this the right way. And I'm like, "Thank you, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I won't do it." <laughs> but people loved it. I mean, it, yeah. I think it helped make it look real. Um, which it is, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, to have that in their hands, you know, most people, you know, the comments we kept hearing from our, our supporters and backers was that, holy crap, I got this in the mail. I don't know any other Kickstarter who, who has ever done this. And, and that's why we did it. I mean, I used to be the master of, of print ads, so I, I knew it had cachet and I knew people didn't do it anymore. And I thought people would really stand up and take notice of it which they did uh which was good even if i got in some trouble (laughs) questions jacob no no at this point it's like (laughs) you you covered the one because i was going to ask about uh the the flyer that went out because i got super jazzed when it showed up in my mailbox and i was like oh this is (laughs) (laughs) i know my well way around ip lawn well enough to know like I, I I smell a problem. <laughs> it was very nice really receiving oh, that. Yes. Though. It's, it's it was surprised. Yeah. Like, just wow. On our Discord server, people were like popping off going like, I got mine. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and of course there was never before seen art in yep. that flyer. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was art that we had seen, but we had never before seen it color. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. The, the terror bears, even though it was a postage stamp sized image, it was very crisp and clean and beautiful. And yep. some of the other art. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and that's, you know, that, that's sort of Palladium's trademark, or at least, you know, one of my underlining themes is I want to surprise our customer base. I want people to go wow over our products. And that was a way to deliver a little bit of wow factor. So the books that would, we've already mentioned were more or less following the release of the comics. From my opinion, as a, as a fan, as a player of the game, it felt like each one was building up, building upon the success of the previous one, incorporating more, becoming a better and a smoother and a more awesome product. And then it all came to trans-dimensional TMNT, mm-hmm. which... You've probably heard this many times. It's one of the most awesome books ever made. Like the concepts of time travel and just the patterning of the way time and dimensions work with each other is one of the only, in my opinion, functional systems of time travel I've ever seen in a role playing game. I I agree 100%. I'm not a, a, a time travel fan. Uh, especially in games, and uh, that's 100% Eric Woodjick, and I read it, and I'm like, Eric, this is great. You know, I, you know, thank you for for doing this. And they, like I said, it was 100. That book is 100% Eric Woodjick. Wow, and and still there were only like what 10, 12 issues out at that time. So mm-hmm. so much of that just came out of his head. <laughs> just yeah. Like, how closely was he working with Kevin and Peter? Or was he just largely like, were they just like, do what you want, man? Uh, they they were pretty uh, do what you want. I mean, wow. you know, the, the, the initial game, uh, you know, the RPG, they were more closely involved. But I think we won them over. I mean, it's great stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of remember Pete saying, well, Kevin, you're the experts in this field. You do whatever you think is necessary. And as long as it fits with our comic book lore, we're good. 
So that's that's pretty much what we did. Wow. That's just madness. Like the turning something over that you have created that has made you I mean well you the general you them really but were they were they millionaires by this point like had it really taken off or was that no i, I mean they were they were a comic book phenomenon yeah mm-hmm. you know i don't think they get the credit they de- they deserve for having started the black and white independent comic book craze mm-hmm. uh them and a few other comics really struck a nerve and really launched things but no they they were like hey we can make a living at this how awesome is that that that's where they were kind of at and then uh they wouldn't be millionaires until the early 1990s mm. late 1980 in fact in, i want to say it was 1990 where i was telling kevin pete wow guys this is fantastic you guys must be making millions and millions and they're like well the funny thing about that is on paper <laughs> we're, we're worth millions but we haven't actually gotten like more than one small royalty check and that would obviously change you know a year or so later but you no know, they were just struggling artists and creators who had a lot of great ideas yeah, I remember when that movie came out, and I want to say it was 1990 because it was, you know, Jim Henson Studios making yeah. Ninja Turtles. Mm-hmm. You're like, what is my world coming to right now? <laughs> and yep. just it it was darker. It had darker themes. It had actual characters fighting because you know cartoons they run around and they've got weapons and maybe GI Joe's got guns. But no one who isn't a robot ever gets hit with one of those weapons or guns. It's always very, yep. you know, implied, but they never show the violence. And then finally the movie comes around and you're like, this is what I have wanted. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, just being able to take that home and now roll some dice. And here's some official rules for how I can do that. And I can play out all of those scenes that very, very closely mirror the comics in a in a really cool way. Well, that was the crazy thing when when I got the license. I, I knew exactly what the game needed to be, and that guy who had called me and, and said, "Hey, you should make the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle role playing game." I, I gave him the first shot at at writing the the game, uh, and only seemed fair. He was excited. I was excited, and. You know, meanwhile, you know, Eric and I, we were at a point in our lives where I, I was a, one of these people who worked through the night. My my kids would go to sleep around eight o'clock and because they were little. And then uh, my wife would go to sleep around 11. And that's when my, my work day really kind of began, 11 o'clock at night. And, and Eric was working a job where he uh, had to do some computer stuff at the Detroit News. And then once he had gotten certain machines going or calibrated or whatever the hell he did, he basically had like five hours of just sitting there with nothing to do. I mean, he would read, he'd make notes and write things. And so I would give him a call around midnight or 1230 and we would talk for two or three hours almost every night. So I I told Eric about the Ninja Turtles and how cool this comic was. I got him hooked on it. And then he and I kept talking about, you know, what should be in the game. Because I'm like, it's got to have, you know, the rules to create any type of mutant animal. It's got to have animal powers, you know, maybe psionics, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of different elements. And Eric and I used to love to just spitball ideas and brainstorm and even if it went nowhere it would drive my wife crazy because you know <laughs> eric eric would come over and we'd we'd talk you know in the basement or in my office or outside for four hours and i'd come back in and she goes like so did you work out whatever it is you guys were, were you know for, for this current book and i'm like oh uh no what did you talk about x y and z um no <laughs> And she's like, well, what the hell were you talking about all this time? And it's like, oh, this or that. And she's like, so is that like for a, a, a new book? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I 
do you as a creative person, Kevin, find or maybe did at this time that your ideas suddenly start hitting you at like 10 o'clock at night? Like you've spent all day doing whatever it is that you do, maybe doing some writing, maybe doing some organizing, and then you're maybe laying in bed. And then suddenly 10 o'clock, eyes open. I really need to write this down. Well, yeah, I mean, that was sort of my routine. So, yeah, yeah. I started to, uh, you know, get antsy around 10 or so because, yeah, work time is coming. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I would jump into it and have fun writing till five or six in the morning. And the kids and my wife would be getting up to go to work and go to school and I'd be going to bed and, oh. Oh. you know, so and then I'd get up around noon and write for two or three hours and the kids would come home and I could play Mr. Mom until Marianne came home from, from work around uh, five 30 or six and uh, you know, work being palladium. She ran the office and stuff back then. And yeah, it, it was, it worked out really well. Yeah. But you know, really again, ideas, you know, come at the craziest times. I mean, I, I got some of my best ideas uh, in the fricking shower or, or driving home you know, it's like I always had a notepad with me wherever I was because I got to write this down. But, uh, you know, you, you take it where you can get it. <laughs> There's a mechanic in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which I've never seen in another of the Palladium games. And correct me if I've just missed it, but that is the teamwork, team creation mechanic. And it's an extremely simple yet very awesome, extensible, elegant mechanic, mm -hmm. which is very simple. If your group has a lot of the same things in common, you all start one level higher. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That yeah. it it just it explains so much in such a simple way that. You know, someone can come to sit down at your table and you're explaining the systems to them and you're like, oh, yeah, well, I guess we've got some history. Does that come into play? Like, maybe we should get a bonus. And you're like, you already do. You're a level higher because of your yes. teamwork. And it's a level yeah. higher per member. It's beautiful. It, yeah, yeah. It, it was one of those mechanics that I saw it for the first time and went, this just makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's appropriate to the setting material. It's appropriate to the genre. It's mechanically simple. Mm -hmm. You know, just so good. Yeah. There was a lot it of is. wonderful simplicity in, that was deceptively simple, mm -hmm. but also deeply complex in these games. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, again, that, that was, that was Eric, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that, that, I always want to do, and Eric always likes to do, and Sean's this way too. We try to, again, bring that world to life. And so we sat back and went, these guys are a family. These guys are team members. How do we put that, that team aspect, you know, give it some oomph, make it important, make it something you want to play? And that was Eric's solution, and I loved it. As did you, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Kevin, do you have a favorite character that you played in a Ninja Turtles game? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I as a game master, I tend to play the bad guys, so. Yeah. <laughs> I think Jacob and I can both sympathize yeah, with that. Yeah. I think we may have three <laughs> lifer game masters on this call. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so in that regard, yeah, Doc Farrell was was my go-to villain. I love that guy. Yeah, but I mean, the Terror Bears were great. I think that was Eric's favorite. Oh, and, the Terror uh, Bears! Oh my God! Oh, I just <laughs> what you did with them, not only in the first book, but what was done with them throughout mm -hmm. the books, and even I'm going to reference a future topic here, even into after the bomb. Well, using them in what the it was the adventures, the adventures book, using yeah. them as the potential creation for the entire after the bomb scenario was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And and so complex in so many ways. I mean, perfect for the material you were pulling from. And especially at that time for when it came out, 
um, front running complex NPCs in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. In, 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 in very effectively. It's, it's like one of the parts that I always go to as like, if you want to create a quote unquote good villain, they're one of the ones I go, go look at what was done with these characters. Because if you're looking to do a good villain in the role playing game, just go through the TMNT books and look what's done with the terror bears. They're solid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would tend to concur. Uh, I think that was Eric. So one of the things Eric was convinced that I, I created the best, the best villains he had ever seen anyone run in, in role playing. And uh, I don't know about that. I, I mean, I'll take it. I, <laughs> I, I love villains, but I think that was Eric trying to up his game and create some really memorable villains. And, and he knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Was Doc Farrell his too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you know offhand what the true colors of Doc color Doc Farrell's outfit are? <laughs> <laughs> we must establish the canon. <laughs> Kevin, give me the canon. <laughs> yeah, it's like Doctor Scrubs, right? I mean, it's like that tealish. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh my works. God! I wonder how much Harlan Ellison's miniature collection would sell for. Oh yeah. Ooh. If it even still exists. Yeah. He seemed like the kind of guy who would have just rooms and rooms full of things that he's collected over the years, because he was very much a hands-on physical medium kind of guy. You know. Wow. I gotta look yeah, that I up later. To that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, his his estate though is a little bit of a mess, so who knows how it ended up. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. like one of those, you know, luminaries you don't think about being into miniatures or gaming or anything like that. Like the day I learned that Robin Williams was actually a huge Warhammer fan, yeah. you know. It's, yeah. it's like one of those moments when Kevin told me that Harlan Ellison wanted the exact right colors to paint his miniatures. <laughs> this is gonna stick in my head. <laughs> yeah. What well, is funny how many celebs, you know, I, I think we just don't think of of uh, you know, movie stars and writers and other creators being into our little niche hobby. Yeah. yeah. But they they are and, and they love it. And I, I'm amazed at how many people uh have been inspired by by role playing in my games and mm-hmm. you know, our, our the foreword to uh the RPG Redux edition is by Ross and Marshall Thurber, mm-hmm. which is a big up and coming writer director guy i mean he he wrote red notice for uh or wrote and directed red notice for netflix which was the most watched original movie ever ever presented by netflix um you know he's done a bunch of other good fun stuff before that and you know when, when i when i met him he's like kev it was playing ninja turtles and riffs that made me realize I want to be a writer, producer, you know, director, because I yeah. love telling stories. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow. This goes back yeah. to, the, to a conversation uh, NPC and I were having literally less than a week ago. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Um, so that that does raise an interesting question in my mind. We've talked before about how you seem to have a bit of a talent for networking. Um, you know, the the strong you know, not hearing the no <laughs> and, and all of that. So who's the most interesting person you've ever uh, game mastered for? Oh, that's, the, the, I'm sure Eric had, had game masters a lot more. You want oh, to yeah, talk I, about a networker, Eric Woodjick oh, was yeah. just like, <laughs> he, he knew everybody on the flipping planet. I, I mean, seriously. Uh, I mean, he spent, so he, he made so much money on, on the Ninja Turtle books that he quit his job and went wandering around Europe mm-hmm. for like two or three years. I, I, I called him the Johnny Appleseed of gaming. He would yeah. just, hi, I'm Eric Woodchick. <laughs> it's nice to meet you guys. Why don't you put me up in your house and I'll run <laughs> games all week. <laughs> and, and, and people would, and he did. That's and, awesome. And <laughs> so I, I had the pleasure of meeting Eric once and it wasn't in a convention setting or anything. 
he just happened to be in the city I happen to be living in, uh, Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, I don't even recall he mentioned it, but why he was there, but he was there. And your description of how he introduces himself is 100% accurate. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was, I, I am honestly surprised that an impromptu gaming session didn't break out in the uh, coffee shop we were sitting in. <laughs> it was that close. Oh, you like, you like Ninja Suit, Super Spice and TNA, TMNT. <laughs> yeah. No, he, he, I used to say he was a true bohemian and uh, just this kind of larger than life figure. I mean, for those who have not met Eric Woodchick, if you ever seen the the movie or the play Fiddler on the Roof, Eric basically was was Tevia. Um, yeah, he very much looked like that. And in his younger days, he always had like this leather fisherman's cap mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. that that bushy bushy beard yep. and soup strainer mustache. And hey now. he was just this, <laughs> this happy. You know, he was just always happy to meet people and talk about gaming or science fiction or movies or comic books or history or politics i mean he just was one of those guys and i i am a decent networker i think I, i'm sort of a, a networker despite myself mm-hmm. uh because i'm i'm uh, a bit more uh shy uh not that you can tell these days but especially in my youth you know i think guys like eric Woodjick and alex marcinison uh helped pull me out of that so uh but yeah, you know, I mean, I, I I don't know if I can just walk up to anybody and just strike up a conversation like Eric could. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, being able to mix and mingle is it was definitely from the feel from the one encounter I got his strong suit. But you know, it go it differs. People are different that way. Some yeah. people are great connectors because they can walk into a room and make friends with everybody there. Some people are good because, well, maybe that doesn't come naturally to them. They're good at forging long working relationships. And, you know, so I can see how you two were probably one heck of a team. <laughs> oh, yeah. We were. We, we were, uh, I, I guess we were pretty amazing. There was this one time where, uh, and I, I wish to hell I had the tape. I mean, it doesn't have to be edited or anything. There, there was some gentleman who was putting together what he hoped to be a series of DVDs uh, or might even been VHS at the time. I don't remember. I think it was DVDs, which would be like these interviews with creators. At the time there were a series of them coming out for comic book guys. It was like a Todd McFarlane and Stanley and some other things. And I think the guy was inspired by that and he was going to do the same thing for gaming of course, Eric Woodjick <laughs> runs into this guy and convinces him. And the guy was pretty much done with his series, I think. And Eric, of course, convinces him, no, you got to come and do an interview with me and Kev. You, you got to do, you got to meet Kevin. Have you met <laughs> Kevin? You got to meet Kevin. And um, so the guy comes to the Palladium offices and we're supposed to be like his last interviews, I think. And he interviews Eric and then he interviews me. And then he brings us in together. And there's some point where Eric and I are just going. And this guy's like suddenly like, wait, wait, wait. Oh, my God. I ran out of tape. I, 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 hold on. I mean, you guys are phenomenal. I mean, you guys are great one-on-one. But but together, I've never seen anything like it. The electricity. And, and, and Eric and I just kind of look at each other and kind of shrug. And we're like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and, I, and I would love to see those tapes so I could see it. Because, you know, you never know how other people kind of perceive you or yeah. how you come across to others. Uh, not not really. You just can't know. And I, I would love to see what that electricity, you know, looked like. Because uh, this guy sure seemed to think he had captured captured it on, on, on tape. So, but... Uh, yeah, we 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 were we were a pretty great team, <laughs> and, and best friends, man. I mean, just we loved each other to death, and uh, it was great. Well, Jacob, I'm glad you got a chance to meet Eric. Yeah, I mean, it it just so happened. Like, I don't even know why I recognized him, because like this was the '90s, and I just happened to be back in town at that point. 
and I just stumbled up to, uh, stumbled onto the same little coffee shop he and some people were hanging out at having lunch and I just walked up and went hey I just want to say I'm a big fan of your work because like I I don't I don't tend to be one of those fanboy people who gush it's just like hey I want to just show my appreciation and let you get back to your day-to-day life yeah, I'm the same way. You know, yep. it, it's it's like uh, I treat people the way I generally want to be treated in that regard. And the he went, oh, which piece of my work? <laughs> and the dams blew up. And <laughs> and very he, he so there used to be a turn of phrase that was common amongst the RPG community up in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota. It was being a dice in the pocket guy. Uh Uh, One of those people who walked around with a full set of dice in your pocket, ready to game at the drop of the hat. And it was very clear that Eric was 100% one of those. Like I said, I am still stunned. We didn't have a impromptu gaming session right there in the middle of the coffee shop. (laughs) (laughs) No, nope, that that was Eric for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I ended up having a very interesting, wide ranging conversation with him because you know, like the one thing I don't know if this was his normal behavior, but in our conversation, he he really wanted to know what I liked about each game, and so we got into this super in depth conversation about real world var- martial arts via versus RPG martial arts and that sort of yep. thing. So it was. Yep. Yep. Well, no, we like to get, you know, that's the thing is people's input. I mean, we're writing for you guys. Right. So I think any good writer, and and certainly Eric, uh, and especially game designers, you need to know what your audience likes. You need to know what really resonates with them. So, yeah, when we ask those kind of questions, we definitely mean it. We definitely want to know, and we definitely are listening um, because – that's the only way you you learn what your audience wants um and and whether you're hitting or missing mm-hmm. you know it's you always got to be critical of your own work so uh yeah no i'm not surprised plus you know it, it's also about game theory mm-hmm. you know, getting your feedback tells us oh yeah i i nailed that that was what i was trying to achieve and and i nailed it or uh I was trying to achieve this, but but clearly he he missed it, and and I must have gotten something wrong. How can I, how can I fix that in the next game? Yeah. Um. So yeah, that that was Eric, and then, you know, I think one of the things Eric and I had had in common was, you know, we're passionate about what we do, and what you see is what you get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, that there's no facade. There's no let's play games. There's no. Hi, I'm Kevin Sabita or Eric Woodjick, you know, and you're just a lowly fanboy. You know, there's none <laughs> no, of that. None of that. Right? It's, you know, you're one of us. <laughs> that is how we how we look at things. So, turning back to TMNT for a minute, I have a question: Were sales just continually going up and up with each new book you released, um, or did they start to taper out before you finally decided to? put that product line to bed due to the, you know, brand confusion and other things. Um, yeah, no, it, it was taking off. In fact, uh, you know, palladium books was, was just sort of this steady meteor going up and up and up. We, we were at our peak. I think we were growing like 30% a year. Jesus. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, was, it was crazy. I know if you're growing like, like, six or eight percent it's like good job and yeah we we were doing between 20 and 30 percent for like the first 12 years um we just kept you know going up but i mean think about it we we had we we had good things going of palladium fantasy we had good things going of heroes unlimited and then we get ninja turtles and then we get robotech and then we have ninjas and super spies we fool around of stuff like beyond the supernatural and then riffs mm-hmm. and, and and plus we had the uh, robotech videotapes mm-hmm. i mean it was just man we were just taking off and uh there was like no stopping us 
I mean, you had a role playing game where I could make a mutant cassowary. Yes. So, I mean, yes. of course, it's amazing. Good time. <laughs> <laughs> of of all of the TMNT books, not counting the after the bomb, but just the TMNT and other strangeness books, which is your favorite? Uh, well, obviously, uh, it, it's sort of split between the RPG mm-hmm. and transdimensional TMNT. Yep. 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 That makes total sense. The the writing there is some of the tightest I've ever mm-hmm. seen in an RPG. I mean, the, oh, yeah. ma- the main book. Um, you did l- so much with so little a page count. Mm-hmm. So much is happening there. And yeah. there's all those adventures in the back. And there's it's it's wonderful. A- and Great game. I, I'm going to do a little bit of a geek out on layout on that one, uh, just because they're, you're probably going to burst a bubble for me here <laughs> that I've been living in this little delusion for the last several decades. But there seemed to be a lot of intentionality on the art choices that were put on each specific page throughout that one. Oh no, absolutely. That that was all deliberate and and the layout was was all me and uh yeah, one of the things that drive, drive still drives me crazy when I see it. You don't see it quite as much nowadays, but you still see a lot of it. it, it is role playing games where here's this 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 character or or NPC and here's this cool piece of art and you're like, "Wow, what is that?" Mm-hmm. It's a cool piece of art. Yep. The end. Yep. It, it has yeah. no <laughs> no purpose in the book other than it's it's you know might as well be a border or mm-hmm. you know, some other graphic because it's just this pretty picture and that that drove me crazy and for me um, I think it comes from my comic book background um, story and art they're they're integral and you want them to work together and when they work together it tells a bigger stronger story. And so when you read about the terror bears and you look at that art, you oh. go, oh, you know, as opposed to nothing or just, you know, a pretty picture that has no, no meaning, you know, I, it's no, that that's very deliberate. Um, that's something I've tried to do with my books from the very beginning. Yeah, that's um, one, you know, that's potentially if I was to name this is Kevin's layout magnum opus. <laughs> that, that might be the book because, you know, I was looking through it the other day in preparation for this episode and like there's no no piece of art that just seems to be good for the page. It's like every piece of art in that book is perfect for the page it's on. Like one of my favorite pieces, and by the way, one of one of Joe Manganiello's favorite pieces is that transition from dog to human. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, and, yeah. and you know, let, let's give credit to Eastman and Laird. I mean, I, I would tell them what I want, and those two guys would just freaking nail it. Absolutely. So, you know, it helps if you have a great talent that you're working with. <laughs> So how d- let's discuss that process a little bit because they did do a lot of original artwork for TMNT. And what was the back and forth like with them? You'd tell them what they want, you they send it to you the first th- was it like every single one first time out of the box was sm- smack on or was was it a more collaborative process where they came back to you and went, "Well, can you give us a little bit more on what you need here or there or how would that go?" Again, I think we were pretty simpatico, and they were pretty excited about it. I, uh, you know, we would mostly talk a lot about it and talk about what we're trying to convey and what this character should be. Like Doc Farrell's a great example of, you know, we wanted him to be sort of a Dr. Frankenstein type where he's this mad genius creating these wild creatures. But so we wanted to show him and, and, and show him kind of aloof. And then we wanted a couple of his henchmen, you know, mutant animal henchmen in this crazy lab. And again, Kevin Pete just just freaking nailed it. I, I don't think there were any pieces that we sent back to them. So so we would talk about what we wanted and the atmosphere we wanted. And then uh, we would they would send me a, a, a pencil sketch 
sometimes and sometimes they'd go just direct to a tight pencil and they would send me photocopies mm -hmm. in fact some of those will be appearing in uh in the books on uh, the redux editions where nice, you get to see nice. their pencil and uh, in fact i also have a cool note from from peter laird written in like red sharpie uh talking about the assignment and here it is i hope you like it sorry we're a little late or whatever and uh i i don't know i i I think because I'm so into what we do and I'm so into the artists, uh, if that makes sense, because mm -hmm. I mean, I love this kind of stuff. And uh, you, know, you sometimes hear, you know, movie directors referred to as an actor's director. Mm -hmm. Well, I think me and, and, and nowadays Sean, we're sort of artist publishers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we nurture our writers and our artists and we appreciate them so there was one point where kevin eastman were having a nice chat and he goes so kev here's the thing we don't understand and i'm like what's that he goes we feel like we're doing our best work for you and i'm like great and they're like no no shouldn't we be doing our best work for ourselves <laughs> We can't explain it. I mean, can you explain it? And I'm like, eh, 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 I don't know. But I, I think, you, you know, I, I think some of my enthusiasm gets is kind of contagious. And I get people really revved up and into it and loving what they're doing and excited about the project and themselves. And, you know, a happy artist is going to give you their best work. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of as simple as that. <laughs> so we got some of their best work out of them. You brought up Doc Farrell. And Doc Farrell brings up the, like, one bone I have to pick with you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Y'all managed to create a character that has, had to, ha has put me in the position of having to explain what vivisection is more times <laughs> than any other thing in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and then have to get have people get mad at me <laughs> because of what vivisection is. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, that's more funny than anything. It was just like that. That every single time it got to the point where if I introduced someone new to TMNT and they read the book, I knew they were going to be coming back going like, what's vivisection? <laughs> because they knew I know. <laughs> I know that we are approaching the time that you would like to leave, Kevin. Do you have any other stories that you want to tell that we haven't already had? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there's probably a million of them. Yeah. You know, it, it's not RPG super specific, but uh, it, it's certainly turtle related. So, uh, and I talk about this in, in the history of the Redux edition, just because as a dad, it, it's just a fun story. So, you know, my, my kids were immersed in what we were doing. And so, of course, they knew about turtles and they were reading comics and enjoying them. And like, this is probably 1987. And maybe 88, but probably 87. And, and my daughter, who's like 10 years old, says, I want to go out trick-or-treating as Leonardo. And we're like, awesome. Well, bear in mind, this is before the cartoons, before the mm -hmm. movies, before the toys. Oh, wow. So, oh. Right. You, you get where this is going. So she makes this amazing costume with the help of her mom and me. Um, she has this beautiful uh, turtle shell that she can wear made out of paper mache. Oh, she's got these two wooden swords we got at the Renaissance Festival. <laughs> she's wearing the skull cap, and she's you know body painted everything. <laughs> she, she looks fantastic, <laughs> and every and I mean every single house she goes up to, they say. And what are you supposed to be? And, and, you know, they've got this incredulous look. I'm like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. and, and she proudly announces, I'm a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, Leonardo. <laughs> and they're like, what? 
I'm a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, Leonardo. <laughs> they were like, okay, have some candy. <laughs> and, and, you know, and poor Monica is getting worn out. Yeah. You know, every every house she goes to, it's kind of like the same thing. And finally, she's like, why don't these people know who the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are? <laughs> and then a few you know, year, and a few years down the road, over the breakfast table, they're going, "Hey, you remember that one kid who showed up at home?" <laughs> I often wonder, do they? Do they? Or was it totally forgotten? Because yeah, two years later, half the freaking kids are dressed up as one turtle or another. Right. And yeah, yeah it makes me wonder. I, I wish I had photos. I, I tried to find oh. photos, but I think they've been lost mm. over the ages because we took a bunch of photos of her. She looked great. Yeah, two years later, the whole world would know who the Ninja Turtles are, but not that Halloween. <laughs> Poor so, kid. So, Kevin, is there? we're coming to the end of our time. Is there anything you want to plug? Any upcoming announcements from Palladium Books? Anything related to the Kickstarter? Anything at all? Well, backers, like 80% of our backers for the TMNT and other strangeness Kickstarter have filled out their survey and, and adjusted their pledge. Um, that still leaves 20% of people out there that we need you to do soon. Um, we're probably shutting down the pledge manager in the middle of April. So the sooner you guys can get us that, the better. Um, we have a ton of art that's being approved or has been approved. We're kind of waiting on some of that. We're, we're waiting for the fabled Kevin Eastman finished color, you know, Ooh, cover painting. Seriously. I'm so excited the to get this. <laughs> the guy is so busy. Yeah. You know, we've been, I've been hearing Friday for like the last eight weeks now. Yeah. Um, so uh, no slam on Kev because he's, he's awesome and amazing and we appreciate what he's doing, mm -hmm. but you know, we just haven't been able to show that yet. And we wanted to show a bunch of other stuff with it. We we got the uh, mutagen green dice. Um, oh, they're beautiful. They're they're everything I wanted them to be. Uh, Sean did a great job conveying that to the manufacturer. Um, they they look great. Are these are the ones that have the goo in the side. Yeah. How do they roll? They roll really nice. Okay. okay. Really nice. In fact, I, I, I was making jokes earlier. because We were on a conference call first with, with Paramount and then with our social media guy, Chris, Chris Landauer. And I just kept rolling him and rolling him, I think, to the annoyance of Sean. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I can't help it. They're addictive. I just like looking at them. Because just the way the fluid inside has got like this sparkle and almost like when a die stops, it's like, it's kind of almost like a snow globe where you have this like poof Ooh. and then you see it kind of settling down and it almost looks like it's, it's kind of like boiling mm -hmm. and just the way the light hits it. I just, I love it. I love it. So I'm really happy with that. Everything's coming together like crazy. Um, I guess the thing I would like to plug if this goes up in time and don't, please don't feel obligated to rush NPC, but uh, we have what we're calling our big uh, GM's day sale. Mm -hmm. Uh, it coincides with um, the uh, drive through RPG GM's Days sale, which we missed. We were so busy, we, we didn't even realize it was happening. But we still want to do our sale of physical books. So we are, that's going on right now to at least uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. And, uh, you know, it's 30% savings. So it's a good time to buy. It, it covers a whole bunch of main titles and good stuff from most of our game lines uh and another than that you know keep the faith we are busting our backs to get things done we got all kinds of stuff we can't talk about some really exciting things mm -hmm. another possible another possible license mm -hmm. that we didn't expect would be uh we just didn't expect so and and, and it's not it hasn't happened yet so okay, but yep. we're in we're Mom's. in talks yep so uh, we're, we're pretty excited about that. You know, uh, I've been doing a lot of art lately. I'm doing some of the art for the Redux edition. Oh, nice. I've got two tribute pages that have been approved. And then uh, Sophie Campbell is going to color one of them and probably oh. Mike Majestic, the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Sophie's a huge fan and we've gotten pretty tight. So I, I didn't even think of it. I didn't want to bother. I know she's really swamped. And uh, Jeff Whitman at... Uh, 
Paramount said, have you, have you offered this to, to Sophie? And, and we're like, ah, she's so busy. And he's like, no, I think you should really <laughs> offer this to her. I think she'd want to do it. Cause it's my, it's my homage page to uh trans D. So, and she's a big, huge fan of mm-hmm. uh, trans dimensional team and T also. <laughs> So uh, I, I reached out to her and she's like, yes, I'd love to. Yeah, we just sent it to her this afternoon. But everything's looking good. Everything's moving along. Um, we got all kinds of great stuff happening. You know, uh, a bunch of our regular books are, are moving along. Uh, Riff's Beast Jerry and... Uh, oh, I'm so excited to get that. That first one was so good. It's so good. 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 Yeah. I think you'll be happy with this. Yeah. It's another one of those books that, uh, just a side note, listeners, if you haven't had the bestiary one, it's another one of those books that if you if you listen to us long enough, you know I like books that ooze with content. Like every single page of that is just full of ideas of things to do. It's one of my favorite Riffs books of all time. Anyway, back to you, Kevin. Thanks. <laughs> and then, uh, well, along those lines, um, Sophie is just reading uh, Riffs uh coalition manhunters now mm-hmm. and she was you know freaking out about how good that book was because she hadn't read it yet and she's incorporating a bunch of stuff into her game she, she plays every weekend nice. uh, a couple of different games and uh she's like oh my god this book is so good and i'm like thanks i think it's one of the best things i've ever written uh and she said i agree so that that was pretty cool and uh you know that that's it we're uh you know, rocking and rolling and trying not to go insane in the process. Do you have time for one last question? No. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I was just reminded by scanning over some of the comments on our Discord. The Something that several of us noticed in the uh, preview and teaser images that came out of the Ninja Turtles book from the Kickstarter is... Uh, a very subtle change in some of the terminology, specifically that one of the changes was from attacks per melee to actions per melee. Is that a sign of things to come? Absolutely. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Yeah, the Redux edition will kind of showcase a bunch of things that uh, where, where we're heading. Uh, wow. Wow. That's Excellent. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I I will say that our Discord has been going through <laughs> everything y'all dropped. Like yeah. one, just to geek over the art, <laughs> and two, going like, I, I swear we have a archival team practically yeah. going through trying to figure out what the end product's going to look like from the little cr- crumbs that are dropping off the edges of the yeah. promo pieces. It seriously <laughs> is like every time a new Star Wars movie teaser trailer would come out, you know how within minutes there'd be people like pouring over each individual frame being like, oh my God, there's this thing in this. Oh, the, that, that's clearly a, a, a movie two blaster or something. And you're like, okay, where are they going here? That's that's that, what's happening that, with, that's with our people. what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's funny. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, people will not be disappointed that's what i'm trying to tell folks is that we have big plans we're starting out kind of slow but you know people are are so excited about it and they're gonna love these redux editions uh on so many levels just just the art the information the 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 way things are laid out nice little tweaks that signify small little changes and and clarifications and rules and uh, presentation, um, you know, and that's a lot of that, Sean, a lot of that stuff that, that I've wanted to do for a long, long time. Um, and we're finally getting to do so. Yeah. They're, they're going to be very happy with that. And a lot of the stuff that's coming. Well, that, I, I mean, I'm jazzed. I, yeah. I, I, I'm like in the mo- place where I have to like, just kind of locked down to control my excitement. <laughs> you know? But I, so I am actually super excited. Uh, I check my email daily for Palladium update. <laughs> you know, And it's been great having you on, Kevin. It's uh, been wonderful. We, we love each and every one of these, uh, both the s- stories directly related to the role-playing game we're talking about in the episode. Plus, 
the stories around the role playing game. And yeah. and again, thank you for sharing that. Um, the feedback we've gotten from our listeners is they love both things, which is great. So yeah, thanks for being available again. Oh my my pleasure. I'm I'm loving it, and yeah, I'm only hearing positive things about your podcast too yay, so yay. great job happy to be part of it thank you well uh that's all for now folks but i believe if you stay tuned another week we'll have even more coming out even more even more thanks again kevin we'll catch you next time bye-bye have a good one starships magic mystic martial arts romance all of these can be found in A Cloak of Blades by Isaac Sher. You might have heard my name before. I've done a lot of voiceover work for Breakfast Puppies. And I've recently released my first novel. It's available on Amazon as an ebook and paperback. And you can get it for free if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. I do hope you'll support my work as you're supporting Breakfast Puppies. And it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Have a good one. You've been listening to The Glitter Boys, a Palladium Books fan podcast. Glitter Boys, Rifts, the Megaverse, and all other such topics are the property of Kevin Sambita and Palladium Books. Please buy all their stuff and help keep them in print and making more games. You can order directly at palladiumbooks.com and their entire catalog is available digitally at DriveThruRPG as well. Our opening music is 8-Bit Bass and Lead by Furby Guy from freesound.org. This closing music is Caravana by Philip Gross, available at freemusicarchive.org. All sound effects used are self-made or acquired via Creative Commons Zero License. If you like what you have heard, find us on Twitter and Facebook as The Glitter Boys. That's B-O-I-S. And check us out online at breakfastpuppies.com slash glitterboys. And also join us on the Breakfast Puppies Network Discord at breakfastpuppies.com slash discord. And if you want to help us out, please spread the word and help us build a community. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time.